Hey, good morning, all. Welcome to the Common Good Podcast. It's Wednesday, May 11th, and on Wednesdays here on our daily podcast, we like to talk with people about faith and how their own faith compels them to the common good in this world that we live in. And today we're going to be talking about what we can do around reducing gun violence in the United States. I mean, it is um, something that has been a raging problem in the United States for a very long time. And our current situation of so many guns in our world affecting so many people especially young people uh, especially young black and brown people in the united states is something that um, we all need to take more seriously and do something about and today we're joined by brenda k mitchell brenda is herself uh, a person of faith she's a pastor she works with a great group that we're so proud of uh called moms demand action and See me, hear me calling it Mams Demand Action, Moms Demand <laughs> Action, uh, and uh, Brenda is a is a pastor, and she's also someone who's experienced the impacts of gun violence herself in in her own life. Um, Brenda, so glad to have you willing to chat with us today about this and to put out a clarion call about what we can do around the issues of gun violence uh, here here in the United States. Uh, but as we often do, we like to start by talking about. What's the weather condition where you are? And the reason we do this is because everybody experiences weather, right? It's one of the few things it feels like in our society that we all share in common is what's going on in the in the skies and the air above us and around us. So I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's a lovely day, 68 already this morning at you know 10 o'clock a.m. and uh, it's going to warm up to a, just a lovely spring day. How are things in the Chicago area? Well, we're looking at 88 degrees today, and it has not been kind on my hair. So um, this is not a great hair day, but I'm here. <laughs> well, Brenda, having just met you uh, now, your hair looks great. Um, well, thank and, you. And uh, I, I cover up my own you know, hair issues by wearing a hat all the time. <laughs> Hey, uh, Brenda, your, your own story is is really powerful. Your your son was a victim of, of gun violence. You've committed yourself to working with families who are impacted by gun violence, trying to message to people in the rest of the country around gun violence. Um, can you tell us a bit a bit of that story and how you how you got into all this important work? Yes, um, in two thousand five, um, we had just sent my other son Kevin overseas to fight his third um, conflict in war in Afghanistan, only for a week later to bring him back to bury his brother in a free country. And the irony of that, Kenneth had just gone out that evening. He was a single parent of two boys and another son that was born 30 days after Kenneth's death, who Uh could not understand how everyone else knew his father but him. Um, Kenneth had had a weekend off and was preparing for the Super Bowl. He was a manager at a golf course. And so they were preparing for a Super Bowl. And um, at that time, he um, just was enjoying the evening with a couple of his friends shooting darts and just having polite conversation. As he exited the building, there was an argument Um, in the parking lot of the facility. Nothing physical, just a verbal. Um, The verbal ended up being that as Kenneth was trying to de-escalate the conversation, another young man went to his car and picked up a gun and came back and just randomly started shooting. Um, Mm -hmm. There were two victims. Kenneth was the only fatality in that um, incident the other person was an innocent bystander as well that is uh, such a tragic story i'm so sorry for your loss and you know that being in 2005 i'd imagine you still uh, feel that pain in different ways uh on a regular basis yes absolutely and you know for me it did not hit me immediately um because i had to realize i was relevant to his two sons that were still here and the other to be born. So I didn't really have the opportunity to grieve at that point, but it did hit me 12 years later, believe it or not, and threw me into, you know, full flown PTSD and trauma. So that was difficult time for me, but yeah, absolutely. Were were you already tuned in to the, um, 
issues of gun violence in, I mean, Chicago has been a city that has dealt with the, you know, the impacts of gun violence for a long time. Were you already personally uh, aware of all this and, and connected to the issue of guns? You know what? I wish I could say I wasn't. However, I also lost a brother to gun violence. So I became my mother. My mother lived through it. And I watched the impact of that on her. And um, my faith told me that as difficult as it was for her, that God would also bring me through this. I would do it differently, but Mm. I would still have to rely on God to bring me through it. So you're dealing with generations now of people who've been impacted by by gun violence. Your grandchildren, your your mother, uh, I mean, people on both sides or sons on both sides of your family, you know, your son that was in war. Um, I mean, war is another way that gun violence shows itself right in our world. And there's just so much so much violence uh, around and the training and the use of guns. When people ask you, like, how how should they think about this issue if they haven't had the kinds of experiences that you have? um, Do do you have a pretty clear answer for what we should do about gun violence? Or do you feel that it's something that's mm, more difficult for us to come come to a come to a place of, of a better way of thinking about guns in our society? I think it's a difficult place, but I think it's necessary for us to really understand that, you know, while we like to think of it as just a black and brown um, Mm -hmm. issue, the crime is truly on humanity. We are a free country. And if our testimony cannot be any greater than this, then it's a sad statement um, of our legislative branch, which is responsible to the constituency that puts them in office. And so it's a failure on their part, not ours, because we keep sounding our voices and making it known in a free country, in a country that always talks about morality, that that we're okay allowing mothers to bury their children, which is not the normal um, state of things. This is not what we do. We used to bury our own our elders. Yeah. Um, and and this is not how our response should be to gun violence. We should not be okay with yeah. seeing a whole generation of children being placed in the grave and then the other ones to the jail cell or back out on the street to perpetrate further crimes. You know, you, you remind me a lot of the history of Mother's Day, which you know we just celebrated in this country a few days ago. And the history of Mother's Day was that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, mo- mothers joined together through churches to call for the end of war because they were saying they're tired of burying their sons. Yes. That moms were saying, we have to do this differently. Now, since then, Mother's Day has not remained an anti-war movement. It has become a day okay. where we honor mothers for all their other great contributions. Um, but that impulse has been in our society for so long. And in fact, societies all around the world that have wanted for violence to come to an end and to address it very directly, and that mothers tend to be the ones who do that. And you're affiliated with a group called Moms Demand Action, and you're on the Faith Advisory Council for that group. Yeah. To talk about how that group has been important to you and what its role has played in your, in your own life. It has been life-changing for me, and it has saved my life because Mm -hmm. it has allowed me to have a voice. It has allowed me to move beyond myself and let my voice be heard, Um, to have an understanding that Kenneth didn't die in vain. Kenneth, don't put a period behind his name because he's still Mm -hmm. speaking, because as long as his mother um, has the opportunity and um, every town for gun safety and mom's demand action gave me that voice, gave Mm. me that strength to rise up above myself and become an advocate for common sense gun laws, um, getting rid of ghost guns. Um, It is the largest gun violence prevention organization in the country with over 8 million supporters. Um, And we've done a great job of bringing, keeping gun violence in the public eye. 
and and every town that's the group that was started by gabby giffords and and others is that is that right that's that's the group yeah shannon um renee is uh, ha, has been the um one of the grassroots um leaders in this organization and you know th there was uh, there was a period when gabby giffords who was a congresswoman was shot and um and subsequently, you know, started this this effort and others to deal with gun violence in our society. There was a shooting at Congress people practicing baseball a few years ago. There have been mm -hmm. shootings in every context we can imagine in the United States, religious meetings, concerts, streets like where Kenneth was killed, um, private homes, prayer meetings. There, there's hardly a place in our society that in the last dozen years you can't mark a gun violence activity and i had thought previously that maybe what would move society was when certain people were affected by gun violence like maybe if congress people are affected they're going to move on some gun gun legislation but it just seems like there's no place and no tragedy that could be great enough to get the political system to respond. Kindergartners being slaughtered isn't enough, right? The, so this change is gonna have to come from something other than an escalating amount of crisis. What, what, what do you think it's going to take for us to put you know, gun, gun legislation in place that will help protect people? Or do you think as the gun rights people say, there's just no law that can do this. We have to deal with it at some other level in our society or something like that. Do you, do you, have, a, do you have a sense of that? What I feel is that it's not enough. Um, you, you have to understand that 110 Americans are killed with guns and more than 200 are shot and injured. Um, how can we say that this is not an issue? We are losing more people in this country than others are losing at a bona fide war. Um, yeah. We have to be uh, very conscious of what's going on in brown and black communities. And we all have to get on board and address the issue of gun violence. Um, it has not stopped with the pandemic. It has escalated to ungodly proportions. And yet we still say it is not an issue. Um, gun rights advocates don't understand that what we're doing is not a charge against their Second Amendment rights. My husband owns a gun. He understands his right in the Second Amendment. But he is a responsible and always has been as a member of law enforcement and the military a responsible gun owner. And that's all we're asking for. Pass common sense laws that will not allow us to bury our children in a moral country. Do you, I know that very quickly these issues can just turn to legislation like we're doing now. You know, what what is the common uh, sense or common good policies that could be passed? And, and I know that sometimes that can feel distracting from the personal uh, strife that, that's in all this. So I want to be careful not to not to do that. Do you have a, a, a really clear sense of some accomplishments that could be made by passing some legislation? It feels to me like one of the issues is we can't do this piecemeal. You can't have one city or one state having different gun laws than those who are right around them because people move between cities and states, right? Nobody lives just simply in one location and so as people move so do all the things people own including guns so you can say well you can't buy a gun in chicago but you can buy a gun in other states and just drive into chicago so gun you know it doesn't feel like we can accomplish this in a piecemeal fashion um is the answer really to make something more consistent in every every place in the country do you think that's that's the essential piece of this it has to be um, consistent. You've figured Illinois has tough gun laws, but right on our border of Indiana, we see guns being trafficked into the Chicagoland area. We're not um, 
owners of gun um, buildings. We, we're not manufacturers, but yet guns are flowing into our area from other communities of states, such as Indiana, which is right on our border and has a pipeline. And then we don't want, we license everything, but we don't want to license um, gun dealers or gun owners. You can't do my nails without a license. You can't do my hair without a license. You can't babysit without a license. But yet, it's okay for us to have something as critical as guns without a license. It, yeah. it just doesn't make sense. Uh, I have uh, long been uh, just shaken and concerned by the other narratives in our society of not just people having guns, but of people shooting at each other. And I'm told regularly, and I, I think it's true, that you can't correlate certain activities like movies that people watch, television shows, games that they play with behavior. So it's not as simple as just saying, if you, watch, if you play certain first-person shooter video games, like the fact that we have a category of video games called first-person shooter that turns you into the shooter or at the mall of America near where I live, that there's, you know, a laser tag, uh, uh, game space in the, in the mall. That's enormous and it's called urban combat. So you play yeah. role play that you're in a war zone in an urban environment and you get to go in and shoot at each other. You can't correlate someone doing that activity playing those games, watching certain movies with, then the person's going to turn around and go do those things. But it seems to me that there's a desensitization, like there's got to be something in our society that just is giving tacit approval to this, um, this approach, not, not just that we have guns or that gun, and I, I'm a very avid, I think we should have less guns. I think we should regulate them at the highest level of uh, a dangerous toxin in our society, like we do other toxins. Right. Do you have a sense of that? I mean, for uh, do, do you think that the, th the other things we do in our society from little kids growing up with toy soldiers or playing cowboys and Indians like when I was a kid or playing Mortal Kombat or going to the Mall of yeah. America and doing urban combat stuff, do, do you think that's a part of all this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because those games desensitize you. And, and, and so you no longer see people as human objects. Yeah. You see them as a game. And in a world where there is no absolutes anymore, you know, we're breeding and we're feeding in to this. Type. And those games are very violent. And so if I'm driving down the street, which we hear and we see drive by shootings, I'm desensitized to that because why? I yeah. see that on the video game that I've been playing since I was a kid, uh, Mortal Kombat, all of that stuff is violent. And we're perpetrating that in this society. Mm -hmm. And yet we're not putting boundaries on it. We're not seeing a human face in that because everything is technology driven. And so I'm just a person walking down the street, but I might as well be a, a piece of technology because mm -hmm. I don't have a human touch or a human sense of sensibility in some of the things that we do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I feel the same and I, I know other people feel differently. I've, I've been talking about this for years and people just say it's just simply not, it doesn't work that way. And I don't think you can jump to those conclusions. I would just love to try it for a couple of decades. Like we know yeah. the situation we have and we know what our narrative has been in this country. Um, around shooting each other or shooting other human beings right. what if we tried that it just as as people who do social influence which we all do you know you're a pastor i'm a pastor we try to create context mm -hmm. that create a new social reality for people in all kinds of ways right. artists do it businesses do it it just seems like that's that's got to be a piece i'm not sure that goes far enough i i'm i'm reminded that is you know as as both of us being christian pastors the the jewish uh, scriptures start with the narrative of the son of God and mm -hmm. the daughter of God having two sons, Cain and Abel, and one kills yeah. the other, right? The whole right. story starts out with son of God has sons, son and daughter of God have two sons and one kills the other. 
I mean, that's, yeah. you know, you're talking about a quarter of the people in the story uh, are murderers and one of a quarter of them are, are victims of murder. So there's something, and I think that text wants us to see the human impulse of wanting to harm one another. And, and I, I'm struck by the fact that human beings are the only, you know, animals that I know that self harm and harm others at a, at a regular pace. Right. So there's something in the human experience that predates all kinds of weaponry and all the rest of it. So for sure, that's the case. And that's why I think because that's the case, we need to be much more cautious of these other of these other elements. How does your faith inform you on your thinking about this, whether it's the story of faith or your own person? Obviously, you've shared that your own personal life and faith and commitment to, to God and faith, hope and love and brought you, you know, has brought you to a place to be actively involved. But around this issue, particularly, how, how does your faith compel you to think about it? My faith has been the foundation and the anchor for me. And so when I'm exercising my faith, I have to exercise my faith with the hope that there is, um, as my dad said, what we do, we do for the better good. Um, and if we don't understand that and that we're called to service all of us. And if it's happening to the least of us, it's happening to all of us. And I often say, and um, I often say, not one of us can do what all of us can do together. Mm. And I think that Shannon um, Renee Watts, who actually is the founder of Moms Demand Action um, Network, took her heart at a kitchen table and created a movement that mm. has um, established the moral majority in yeah. America, contrary to what we see uh, in the decline of the social morale. Um, yeah. And, you know, and we've been followers we've... of that. Amen. Amen to that. And look, we've been at this for so long in this society. You know, I'm I'm 55 years old and I think back to the big debates when I was a child in elementary school, you know, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And handgun restrictions was a major conversation 40 plus years ago in this society. Uh, I know some people are coming to it more urgently now and there's a lot of good reasons because it has gotten more dangerous guns kill more people, both violence done to another person and self-inflicted violence, because that's another piece of it. The amount of, you know, self-harm yeah. that is done, intentional self-harm with guns is, is a, a very real part of the violence that's being done. But we've been talking about this and trying to deal with these issues for a very long time. And great groups like Every Town and Moms Demand Action are new on the scene and have made such tremendous impact. And yet it feels like we're just going nowhere with the broader conversation with people. Like it just feels like we can't seem to get around these issues um, in a way in this country. So do you think we're in a place where it's like the coronavirus, like COVID, where we're gonna have to say, we have to deal with this and try to keep it from reaching pandemic levels, but we're gonna to have to learn to live with it, that there's just baked in to the United States, a culture of guns and a culture of violence, and the two are just with us permanently. And so we have to be mitigating that problem, or do you, I don't, do you have a more hopeful, hopeful vision of, of what things could be? You know what, I'm reminded of Abraham and Lot. And Abraham pleaded with God, if there be one, will you save the city? I think we have to be like that Abraham mentality and say, if there be one child that we may be able to stand in front of that bullet and seize the action to stop, I have to be like Abraham. Yeah. If there be one that every town and moms demand action um, saves by their advocacy 
I want to be on the right side of history. I'm going to ask God, if there be one, will you save the city? That's who we are. That's who we are now. And that's the stance that each and every one of us take. You got to have a passion for it, but you also have to be committed to what you, I've lost a brother, I've lost a son, and others would like you to think that that never happened. I actually had someone say that to me, to my face. But the reality of it is, is that my son is no longer here. So it did happen. Um, how do we deal with it? You yeah. know, I can't lose faith and I can't lose hope. Then mm -hmm. everyone else will have won. Yeah. If if other people are saying to themselves, hey, I, I, I would like to be more involved in this. I'm not sure what to do. I don't know. I don't have a personal experience with losing someone to gun violence in the way that, you know, Pastor Brenda has. I, I, I'm not even sure where I go to, to do that or what could I do? I mean, I could call my congressperson or call my senator or write a letter to the president or, I don't know, say something to the Supreme Court. Um, to, to try to change the laws, but but what can people do? What what's what what are the options that uh, in every town and moms demand action and and the other you know groups that are in the ecosystem of dealing with gun violence? What can what can people do to be engaged in this? If they're interested in getting involved, um, we make it real simple um, for joining Moms Demand Action. All they have to do is to text ready, R E A D Y to Six four four three three, or visit us online at momsdemandaction.org. And there's a Moms Demand Action chapter in every state. Mm. Um, it, yes, we have like 700 local groups across the country. So it's easy to get involved in what um, Shannon says. It's like, it's, it's not a marathon, it's a movement. And so we challenge them to get engaged and get involved. Don't let it come to your neighborhood in order for you to get involved. Now's the time. So I just did that while you were talking here. I typed in 6433 into my phone and uh, typed and sent the word ready. And what I got back was, give us your zip code. And so I'm, I'm yeah. guessing that what it's going to do is it's going to start me down a journey. And this is for uh, for Moms Demand Action. Uh, as much yeah. as, you know, I, I support the group, I'm not a mom. Is Moms Demand Action only for moms? No, not at all. We have some great dads out there that um, do the work. And we even have a student branch of Moms Demand Action, um, Students Demand Action. We've mm -hmm. got dads out there. Um, anybody that has a desire to work on changing what we see in terms of gun laws and advocacy, are invited to join us. What what kinds of things will I, I've, I've filled it out and I gave them my name, gave them my email, literally in the amount of time it took us right here to be talking. That's why I was looking down. So whatever that was, 30 seconds, I think I'm signed up. Um, what's gonna happen now? What, what, what am I gonna run into? Am I gonna be invited to online groups, to in-person meetups? Uh, are you gonna send me videos to share? What 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 happens in the, in the flow of now that, you know, I'm a, I'm a non-mom in the Moms Demand you're, Action flow. You're a non-mom and we're happy to have you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Now you'll be, someone will be reaching out to you. They will share with you the local groups that are available. Uh, we have several different committees that you can join. There's legislation. Um, there's Faith, is, which I'm part of that, Survivor Membership League. There's so much that you can get involved in. The research um, data. There's so many areas that uh, we have opportunities for you to help support the work that we do. You, you being a pastor uh, and being on the Faith Advisory Council, is are there is, are there is there material ways to be involved that are specially curated for people who want to connect their faith with this issue? Is that a yes. subgroup somewhere in the in the flow? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm also, um, you know, faith um, advisory council, as you indicated, but uh, there is, we get together 
during our annual conferences. And we sometimes do special um, things to invite people in as well as a faith community. And so, and we reach out to the faith communities in our local areas. Um, I have presented at churches. I've, I've done functions mm-hmm. at churches. I've shared the information uh, with churches, municipalities, and educational groups, but to allow our faith to be in operation. Um, sometimes we have to move beyond the four walls, and I'm a field minister. So I'm out there with social justice and yeah. making it known that I'm challenging what I see. Um, it's not just enough to say, I believe in um, eradicating gun violence. Mm-hmm. I believe in being actively involved in eradicating gun violence. I don't want to do a funeral. I'd rather celebrate a life, you know, so. Right. That's a great phrase. I don't want to have to do a funeral. I'd rather celebrate yeah. a life. Brenda, when we before we started live streaming and recording here, um, you uh, suggested to add the letter K uh, between Brenda and Mitchell. So it's Brenda K. Mitchell. And some people do that because it's branding, which is fine. It's how they get separated out from, you know, I know the other couple of Brenda Mitchells in the world. But you said this sort of passing comment that uh, I wanted to ask you about. You said, uh, I include the K there in honor of my father. Can, can you say something about that? What, what, what does the K mean? In that? What's that special K in your name? Yes. Um, as a little girl, my dad always called me either Brenda K or BK. Um, those was his terms of endearment for me. And as I grew in the ranks as a professional, um, I realized how important that K was to me. And mm. so I started using the K in honor of my father's term of endearment toward me. And so I'm, I'm pretty adamant about That's that awesome. K because it represents the relationship between my father and I. I love that. I love that so much. Well, Brenda <laughs> Kay, uh, thank you for, for sharing with us today. Thanks, thanks for all this really great work. It's just, um, it seems so important. And frankly, I am uh, sorry for you and for all the other moms who've had to um, lose, who've lost a child due to these issues that we ask the victims then of this violence to be the ones to solve it. And uh, it just feels like that's something that in a uh, a society where where rights are not the only obligations that we have, right? So yes. um, it, it's been an ag- Thank you. And I'm extremely happy to represent every town, Shannon um, Watts, who, you know, is our founder and the work that she started at her kitchen table that has made us all evolutionaries. That's evolutionary. It's a great phrase. Um, We'd love to have you on again sometime to talk about uh, the complexities of trauma. I know that's something you mentioned at the beginning and uh, yeah. uh, Betsy's found you on Twitter already after watching this and has, has raised that, that, <laughs> that you recognize trauma. Um, something my wife is very engaged in. We've, we've adopted two sons through the foster care system. And so that gave us some uh, invitation to think about trauma differently than we had, we had uh, you know, decades ago. And, when you start to see the world through the lens of trauma and yeah. trauma responses, some things start to make a little more sense. There's a little, there's a different way to organize an understanding of the world. Uh, can you just say a word or two about that now? And then we'd love to have you on again to talk, talk more about the issues of trauma and complexity of trauma. But would you say a few words about that? Absolutely. Um, I realized in my own um, evolution, the reality of trauma in my life and that 12 years into my grieving process, I'd never grieved for my son. And I experienced PTSD, complicated grief and trauma. One isolated incident threw me off physically and emotionally. And I had to go back and recapture myself. And in realizing what that has done for me, I started even, believe it or not, in every town, I kind of moved out a little bit from the gun violence movement and moved into trauma. And trauma-informed resources for survivors. Um, And now I do, I help facilitate groups for trauma in um, survivors, bereaved parents, and helping Mm -hmm. them to get through their complicated grief and mourning process. So it's something, I almost died three times in that process. 
And so it became a passion of mine. And so I do um, speaking engagements on it and bring it to the forefront and keep it in front of legislators as well to make sure that we have resources available to parents and siblings who have lost children to gun violence. Yeah, we, we many of us have become familiar in the last two decades with the, with the phrase PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. And that was because of the war in Afghanistan right. and Iraq, right? It came to the United States, we started to see it. It's been around a long time. They used to call it other things, you know, after World War One and World War Two and Korea and Vietnam. Right. But it became a part of the the parlance. And so people get it and they respond to it in the DMS four and five and so on, like in the medical health and mental health world, knows how to respond to it. And there's a lot of training. It feels like in our current day, this phrase that you used is is now coming to a lot of people's understanding the way PTSD did previously. And that's the phrase trauma informed, and then you fill in the blank. So trauma informed yes. therapy or trauma informed faith communities. My wife leads some trauma informed yoga classes. But that idea mm -hmm. that trauma informed, you know, uh, topic, uh, it, that feels like a real advancement in the area of trauma. And that is to say that it's not that trauma is a separate topic. It's yeah. recognizing that trauma influences or informs so many other parts of our lives and that if we don't think about it in these integrated ways it's going to show up it's going to pop back up is, is that how you think about that phrase trauma informed absolutely because one of the things is that when you find yourself in this situation everybody tells you about a new norm there is no such thing as a new norm when one part of you is outside of you. And what I have instructed and I have shared through this process is that we have to create a new narrative, a new narrative that will allow us to see ourselves again, a new narrative that will allow us to create a space for us to be happy again, yeah. which is a very difficult thing to do because you're right. You always go back to that moment of trauma because mm -hmm. that's where you left everything that you love. And um, and you move forward. I was traumatized. An isolated incident put me in a space that I never thought that I would be in. You know, even as a mother, you kind of think that if it's touched my family once, I'm not expecting it to touch me twice. Hmm. But it did. It didn't even miss a generation. It came directly to me. So, well, Pastor Brenda K. Mitchell, thank you so much for uh, for all this <laughs> all you. this good time, and we look forward to staying in touch with you. And thanks all for being a part of uh, the Common Good uh, Faith conversation here on this Wednesday. And uh, thank we'll you talk so to you all much. Tomorrow. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, dear. Bye bye.